Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. How many of you have tried collards and kale last week? Mm, wonderful. How many of you have found that uh, collards and kale love you? <laughs> wonderful. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Rico Hill uh, back to our church. Um, after the wonderful lecture on collards and kale, uh, today's topic is food and, as information. And uh, sometimes we tend to only uh, look at information as something theoretical. But I'm kind of curious what the lecture will be about. I'm expecting the information to be also something practical that we can practice in our life. Um, because uh, we are bombarded by information um, that's not very useful, uh, but that's not why we invited Rico <laughs> to, uh, to give us uh, the lecture today. Uh, so I hope uh, we will all be blessed by the lecture today, and let's uh, bow our heads for the opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible love, for the blessings that you have provided, for the healthy food that you have provided for us, for all the opportunities in our life. We thank you for our speaker, Rico Hill, and we ask for your Holy Spirit to um, touch his heart, to lead him, and to also touch our hearts and bless us through him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good afternoon, lovely people. How are you doing? You good? Did you enjoy your lunch today? Oh, did you see those two big, large bowls of salad? Hopefully you did more than just watched and look at, looked at them. You actually partook of them. It always amazes me, you know, um, as I watch people at the fellowship dinner, they always go over to the hot food first. I had some of the salad, and it was lovely. It was lovely. I don't like olives, though. They had a lot of olives in it. I just danced around them. I danced around them. But I, I'm sure you enjoyed your lunch. Welcome back to this lecture series. Who's here for the first time? First time. Um, Mike, welcome with Edita. Is that right? Did I get it? Fantastic. Welcome, welcome. And my old friends, and you you are a veteran. You have been here, I think, every time. So I wish I had a book or something. I should give it to you, you know. Usually you should give something to someone who comes every time. Today we are looking at food as information. Now you've heard the idea and the concept of food as medicine, right? You've had, you've heard that. And, and who was it who said that? Let thy... Hippocrates said, let thy food be thy medicine, thy medicine be thy food, right? So that's a, that's a beautiful concept. That's a beautiful idea. But today we're looking at food as information. And um, Dr. Hannah said, it, it needs to be practical. So now she's put pressure on me. I have to make it practical now. Now, how many of you saw my first lecture? I came and I did a lecture on the origins of the origin of a plant-based diet. Most of you missed that. And yeah, I remember you were here. Yeah, you had lots of really smart answers. Yeah, I remember that. And of course, uh, Mindy and Philip were here. Uh, Marcus was here. Hannah was not here. But I have to tell you, when I did that lecture, I made a statement. I said, I have two really good stories. Two really good stories. And I said, I'm going to tell those two stories. I told one that first week. I told the second won the second week, but for you all, you haven't heard my story. Now, I have to tell the story again, so for those of you who were here, you're going to have to just work with me because the story bears repeating. I have to repeat it because I need to use the story as a springboard. Is that okay for, for those who were here? So you won't give away the punchline or say anything as I'm, as I'm walking through the story, okay? So here's the story. Are you ready? Let's have another word of prayer. A few people just joined us, and we want to we wanna bless them as they are coming in uh, and have them join us in fellowship of the Spirit. 
So let's have another word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath that you've given us here at the beginning of February. Um, for the saints of God and the Spirit has been here with us, and we just pray that you continue to be with us and abide with us and direct us into all truth that we might see um, your great love. That's what we want to see. And we ask that you help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, welcome. Come on in. I was just saying that I'm telling the story I love to tell. It's about two doctors. How many doctors? You see it up there. It's two doctors. Two doctors. And one, the older doctor, you know, he was a loving doctor, very nurturing, very kind, and he would spend time with his patients. He had a, a very, very wonderful practice in this little small town, but he was getting up in age and ready to retire. And along comes this younger doctor who, you know, he's got new methods and new ideas and you know, he's not quite patient and kind and nurturing like the older doctor. And he just wants to come there, take over the practice, and really just, you know, do whatever he wants to do. So the older doctor said, well, you know, maybe I should just kind of stick around a little longer. Go and find out what, what he's up to. And he sends an informant. Well, it was his, his assistant. Sent her to just kind of find out where he's going to be, what he's going to be doing, what is his practice, and so forth. Right? She comes back, shares with the older doctor. So the older doctor decides, look, you know what? We're going to offer to anyone $500 is all it will cost you for anything that ails you. $500. And the younger doctor was livid. He's like, he's had this advantage. He's had this practice for all these years. And now he has this new scheme. Well, I'm going to go and expose him for the charlatan that he is. So he goes down to his office and goes into the office. He says, I hear you have a special that you're running, $500, and you'll fix any problem. He said, that's right. Well, I've got a problem. So what's your problem? Young doctor says, my problem is I've lost my taste buds. You've lost your taste buds? Yeah, I can't taste anything. I had breakfast this morning, and I cannot taste a thing. I didn't taste anything. He said, you can't taste anything. He says, no, I can't taste anything. Wise old doctor said, hmm. Looked over to his assistant and said, would you reach up there and I shelf and grab me the, uh, that jug that says 22X. Grabbed it, poured a little in the cup. He said, drink that. Took a little sip the young doctor did. He said, Pfft gasoline. He said, I just cured your taste buds. That'll be $500. <laughs> oh, he stomped out of the doctor's office, goes out. He's, he's just flaming mad, right? He said, I can't believe I got had by that old doctor. He said, I'll get him next time. So he goes back the next time. He says, Doc, I got another problem. He said, what's your problem then? He says, well, my memory's gone. Your memory's gone? That's right. My memory's gone. I can't remember a thing. I can't remember what I did 20 minutes ago. My memory is gone. Older doctor says, hmm, that's a tough one. Nurse, reach up there on that shelf. Grab me that jug that says 22 X. He said, wait a minute. <laughs> that was gasoline the other day. He said, I just solved your problem. That'll be $500. Oh, he was really upset now, right? He leaves out. He says, I've got to get him somehow. He said, ah, I got it. He won't be able to get over on me with this one. So he goes back another day. And he's really, really playing it up this time. He's got shades on. He's got a cane. Knocking over things. He says, Doc, where are you? The doctor says, I'm right over here. He said, what's your problem today? He says, I've gone blind. I lost my sight. You've lost your sight. I've lost my sight. I can't see a thing. He says, well, that's a tough one. Nobody has ever been able to cure blindness. Only Jesus has been able to do that. Well, I guess I'll have to just kind of give you your money back. So, nurse, give that man those fresh 
$100 bills over there. He started smiling, getting out his hand. And she came over and she just counted them out. One, two, three, four. Wait a minute. Those are $1 bills. He says, I just cured your blindness. That'll be another $500. Moral of the story. There's wisdom in the ages. There is wisdom among those who have learned things. There is wisdom in that which is old. Sometimes that which we pass off as having no significance or no value at all, it may be the thing that we need. Sometimes you have to go back and look at what really matters. And so today as we look at Food as information, we're going to go back. Now, I need to make something very clear with you. I am not, hear me out, I am not a scientist. I'm not. By, by my trade and by my passion, I love talking about health, but I'm a minister at heart. I'm pastoral. I love caring for people. Amen? That's what I love. So when you hear me speak, even though I'm going to share with you health information at the heart of what I share, I'm always coming from the place of what is going to actually help people to be healthy, whole, mentally, physically, spiritually. Because you know what? When people are healthy, people are happy. And when people are happy, people are healthy. Healthy, happy, healthy, happy, and they become very inspirational, and they inspire others. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll share some science. Yes, I'm going to do that. I'll even share some history. You okay with that? I'll share some history. I'll share some Bible. You okay with that? Right? I'll go there because that's my, that's my passion. That's, that's where I'm anchored. And I'll even share the 6 o'clock news. And I'll share the 6 o'clock news because you find sometimes that people, before they believe anything spiritual, historical, scientific, they'll believe what Dr. Oz says or the 6 o'clock news says. So I'm going to give you all of them, okay? So, now, I have to give you something that was a point of, um, uh, it was an issue last week. Last week I was talking about, how many of you heard last week? And we, we got to a point where the question was raised as I was talking about the longest study that was ever done, the, 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 probably the, the, the greatest longevity study in the history of this world, and I was saying that when you look at the flood, prior to the flood, it was 10 generations of people living 900 and some years. And I took the average because the, the Bible actually gives the ages. And I averaged them out, and it ended up being a lifespan of 912 years. Now, some of you may not be very uh, Bible-oriented or may sort of pass this off as, as fairy tale or fables or just great allegorical stories. That's fine. But nonetheless, it's teaching a point. It's giving information even about food. Because why? The people prior to the flood were primarily on a plant-based diet. So it's teaching the lesson. There's information in this study. And then we see that the longest lived was Methuselah. And then you look at 10, 10 generations after the flood. It's amazing. It gives the ages there as well. And you can actually do your own study. And I gave the text there, Genesis 11 and 25, 7 and 8. It shows you, and you can... You can go through those and average them out, and you see that the average lifespan was 317 years, right? Abraham being the youngest. So that was something that was made an issue last week, and I wanted to make sure that you understood that I wasn't just saying things. You with me? The other thing that was um, an issue was at the end when I pointed out that we could also go to Cousin Cabbage. If you're not going to Kale and Collards, you can go to Cousin Cabbage. And Cousin Cabbage actually is also a cruciferous vegetable. And we saw that cruciferous means what? What happened, y'all? Y'all forgot already? 
What's wrong with y'all? Y'all need more cabbage in your life. <laughs> or berries. Who remembers what it was? It was the word crucify. You hear it in there. And I said, I made a bold statement. I said, that word cruciferous, which is a vegetable that's a powerful one, which, which collards and kale and cabbage, Brussels sprouts, they all come under, and it has wonderful bioactives in it that actually cure, that fight cancer. They actually turn off the genes that cause cancer. And then I brought in the spiritual point. I made the bold statement of saying that cruciferous meant cross-bearing. And somebody said, no way. Well, notice what it says here. Look at the origin. Cross, that's the cru or cruck, right? And fur, bearing. So what does it mean? Cross bearing. So even that food to launch us into this study, there's information there, isn't there? And that information tells you something. And don't miss the point. The point is, is that if the food does such a loving thing as help to turn off cancer, it must have come from a loving source. Is everybody okay with that? Because that's the greatest information that we should be looking at. How is it? Now, let's just say, you all, say you, you had some issues, some sickness, some, some ailment that somebody said there's no cure for it, right? And you happened upon me or I happened upon you and I said, hey, you know, take this. Use it. I think it'll help you. You say, oh, you know, it's the doctor said it was incurable. There's nothing they can do. And you take it, right? And then you go use it. And before you know it, you're getting better. You're getting better. What would you think about me? What would you think about me? I, 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 I said, I made this for you. I, I give it to you. And you can have as much of it as you like. What would you think about me? What, what, from what place did I give that to you? Out of what? Out of love. Out of love. So now as we begin to look at the different properties, the chemical responses, and the chemical messaging that we find in food, we must begin to go back and say, where did that come from? And who delivered that to us? Are you following me? Now, you have to go back to the garden. It's always a good place to go. You want healing? Go to the garden. All right? You want healing? Go to the garden. There are things there that will heal you. Now, I talked about how, you know, this terrible thing happened right before cabbage and kale and collars were needed. Sin came in. This terrible thing of missing or losing sight of that love that was there. But it was there. And it was a message in the food. There was a message in the food. In other words, it was told to Adam there in the garden, of every tree you may freely eat, anything you want. Was Adam being told to go and be intemperate, just eat until you pass out? Was he being told that? Uh, if you were told, look, come into my garden, you can eat whatever you like. Would you just go to town and just start eating everything? What is the messaging? That's what I want you to catch. What's the message that's being conveyed? I have given you this out of my love. Enjoy it. Right? Now, what's the messaging when the message also says you can eat any of these, but not that one? Oh, you're being restrictive. Come on. You're being hard-nosed. You're being unreasonable. Don't eat that one. Like a child, we just stomp our foot and say, can't do anything these days. <laughs> Got 
500 trees, but we can't eat from that one. Huh? It's from this place that we must begin to look at the messaging and the information that is in food. Ah, okay. Here's our roadmap for today. Our roadmap for today, food is information. First thing we're going to do is look at our relationship with food. Do you have a relationship with food? Don't answer yet. Number two, what is nutrigenomics? Ooh, that's a word. And nutrigenetics. What is that? Talk about that briefly, just to kind of steer us in the right direction. The history of food as information. I told you I was going to give you some history, didn't I? We'll get a little, get a little history. And we find that what's new, quote unquote, is actually old. In fact, you find that Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, he said, there's nothing new under the sun. That which was, that which is, that which will be, there's just no new thing under the sun. You all believe that? Oh, good, 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 good. And then finally, we'll close with what should our food be saying? If there's messaging in food, if there's information in food, what should it be saying? What should it not be saying? In fact, we'll even look at some current event things. Okay, first of all, our relationship with our food. Are you in a relationship with your food? Is it a good relationship or is it a bad relationship? Is it like a bad boyfriend? <laughs> you just, you're in it and you wish you could get out of it, but you just can't like a bad girlfriend. Oh, some of you are blushing. Look at you all. We all have a relationship with food. You can't deny it. I listened to one doctor who talked about how while she was interning, and every night just came home and sat down in front of the television and went to the freezer and pulled out a certain item. It was cold. It was creamy. Sometimes it had, it bore the name of Ben, sometimes Jerry, <laughs> sometimes it had chocolate in it, in fact most times it had chocolate in it, and she said she would sit there after having long shifts and would just dig in and be watching mindless television until she scraped the bottom. Calories for days. You know, it's interesting. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. But that's a whole nother story. We have a relationship with food. We do. And food has a relationship with us. In fact, it was supposed to be that way. It was always supposed to be that way. Food was always supposed to inform us. Even down to the cellular level. Food is messaging. And this new science, quote unquote, of nutrigenomics looks at how what we eat, what's in our diet, how it causes our genes to express themselves. And they will either express themselves for good or express themselves for bad. God, listen, God always wanted us to have a relationship with food because, listen, the relationship with our food when it was good actually pointed to a relationship with Are you listening to me today? If it doesn't somehow help you to have a relationship with him, you're getting the wrong information. Catch that? And here's the big question. Are we seeing today that there are things that we are indulging in that's giving some bad messaging? What would bad messaging look like? What would a bad relationship be like? What if, what if, Mindy, I, or I shouldn't put myself in the place of your husband, but what if your husband, Philip, as he talked to you and he shared information about his day, he yelled and screamed, was very mean-spirited. What would that do to you? You'd be stressed out. You'd be stressed out. Stress causes inflammation. So you're all inflamed because he's inflamed. And before you know it, the whole thing is toxic. Now 
Now Mindy's all toxified. That would never happen. I just want to make sure that's clear. I know Philip. But the same thing happens in a relationship with food that's giving you the wrong signals, the wrong messaging. It actually causes inflammation. It causes, causes toxicity. And then before you know it, you've got a disease process. Are you listening to me? It's really, we're going to really make this practical today. But we have to really see and just peel back the layers and see what was intended from the very beginning. Yeah? Does God want you to be healthy? Oh, yes. The text says so, doesn't it? He says, beloved, and by the way, has anyone ever seen my television show From Sickness to Health? It's on 3ABN, a little network, 3ABN. Yeah. Um, um, it's something I always say at the end of the show. Is that quotation right there, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. I give it to you there on the screen in the new King James Version, which makes it a little simpler. I use, I like the King James. That's the, the sword that I like to use. It's the Bible I use. But it says, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Wow. Do you understand the magnitude of such a statement from the one who gave you food in the first place? See, if we think that food has evolved, that was last week's message. We looked at evolution versus, versus what the Bible says in terms of where our food comes from. And we attached what the Bible says to a God who made it, who made it out of love because he first and foremost wanted us to be healthy. And then when there was sickness, he even made something that would take away our sickness. And that's what Kale and Collins was about. By the way, I was so inspired by my last talk, I went home and made collards and kale. <laughs> I made some for the entire week. I'm talking about the Beverly Hill Billy's kind of big old pot. You, talk, you know what I mean? Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, I made a lot. And I just froze it. I'm into that these days. I'm, I'm on a farm now, so, you know, there's not a lot to do out there, except, especially in the wintertime, there's nothing to do out in the yard, so I just cook. Right? And make stuff and freeze it. Yeah, yeah. So so here we see that God wants you to be healthy. He wants above all things. Wait a minute. You all don't look all that impressed with God. Above all things, I want you to be healthy. Even as you are learning the Bible, going to church, studying your lessons. He says, as much as you are prospering in that area, you need to be prospering in your health at the exact same time. Why? Because I care about both. Are you listening to me today? So you, let's be very practical about it. A man is really prospering spiritually, and he's a great preacher and teacher and evangelist and all these things, yet he is sick and dying. Is God pleased? Is that what God wanted? No, it's not. He wants your prospering with health to be at the exact same time that you're spiritually prospering. Now, I've decided, and this is why this message, this lecture is so important, I've decided that I'm eating things with the right messaging. In other words, it's too easy today to know exactly what your food does. For that doctor who ate the ice cream, what was she eating? Did she know? What messages would that ice cream convey to herself? This is the beauty of this new, new science, again, quote unquote, air quotes there, is the fact that the DNA of food communicates with the DNA of your body. And it looks for harmonious activity. And when there isn't, there is discord. Discord leads to dis-ease. Is that simple enough? So in other words, I've said this, I've said this, I'll say it again. Eat some kale, convert, the body converts it to blood, and you've got wonderful bioactives that are going through your body signaling certain health responses. Cabbage, same thing. Eat an orange, same thing. Eat an apple, same thing. Eat a Twinkie. Yeah. 
what's the message? Oh, your body just goes into, what is this? Uh, what was uh, processing? I don't recognize that. This, this chemical, what is that? When we begin to eat according to what it does to our bodies, oh, then you start to have harmony in your body. And then your response is a love response to the lover who gave it. That makes sense? Ah, let's keep going. Now, it's not just what you eat, it's where you eat. <laughs> when you eat, how you eat. Did you know, I used, anybody here eating their car? Don't lie, tell the truth. The, you, you've never eaten in your car? Raise your hand if you've ever eaten in your car. Oh, I tell you, there's some saints here, I tell you. People who are ready to go to hell, heaven right now because they have never eaten in their car. I'm guilty of it. And I've had similar things happen. Not as, not as bad as that. But you know what? No matter whether you raise your hand or not, here's what the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates, that eating and driving increases the likelihood of crashes by 80%. 80%. Yeah, that's crazy, right? This is probably more than people texting. 20% of people, Stanford University study says that over 20% of Americans are eating while they are zooming down the highway. So I just put that there because it's, you know, it's, it's not just really what you're eating that can cause these chemical responses, but it also is where you're eating. Eating is sacred. Anybody disagree with that? What do I mean by that? Sacred. You know, in other words, it's so sacred. I tell my family, don't talk about stressful things while I'm eating. It's sacred. You should be eating at a place where it's calm. You should do it with people. No stressful things. You know, one of the things that is so counterproductive, and that is eating, even counterintuitive, eating while watching the news. Don't do it. It's stressful. Your body is, you know, there's this famous study where they wanted to see what would happen while a cat was eating. They pinched its tail. And after they pinched the tail of the cat, they wanted to see what his digestion would be like. And his digestion was arrested for several hours. When you are eating under a stressful condition, like driving, because whether you think you're stressed or not, it's stressful driving and eating. You're looking, you're making sure that you're not running into someone, you're trying to make sure you don't get stuff on your upholstery, you don't want to spill your soda, and all these things that you're juggling and you're driving. Anyway, so it's not just what you eat, it's when you eat, where you eat, and what is the environment? Because that also can start chemical messages in your body that will counteract the blessing that the good food that you may be eating, hopefully, is not, what is that, Burger King? We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so what is this idea of nutrigenomics? And, you know, I tell you, someone like Hannah can really blow this out of the water. Maybe she will. I'm going to give you the 500-foot view of it. It's simply this. The effect of food died on gene expression. I mentioned that already, right? What you eat, whatever it is, it's going to have some activity in your genes. No matter what. Either for good or for bad. One or the other. And we have to determine with all of with all of the nutritional science out there, so much information. One day coffee's good. The next day coffee's bad. Right? One day eggs are good for you. The next day eggs are bad. How do you know? How do you thank you, Pastor? How do you, how do you navigate through all of that information and it's constantly coming on the news and they say it's good, it's bad, it's good and bad, and then you throw up your hands and say, well, I'm just eating it anyway. Got to die from something. But some people said, right? So that's what nutrigenomics is. And then nutrigenetics is really just looking at the effects of individuals' genetics. In other words, now there are lots of studies on personalized nutrition. In other words, 
what may be good for Hannah may not be good for me based on, you know, my genetics, my genes, and how they express themselves. And I believe that that's true to a certain extent. But in my mind, and you will see as I go through this presentation, that I believe, go back to the garden. Because every bit of science keeps pointing there. Methylation diet. All these types of diets where they say, you want to be healed? You want to be cured? You want to reverse your diabetes? Reverse your heart disease? I have yet to find one study that says a good porterhouse steak is going to reverse your heart disease. A good old pork chop will help you lower your cholesterol. Just eat as much pork chop and bacon as you can. Now, keto diet kind of says that fat is the thing, but every year, it's amazing to me. They come out with studies and they say, this is really not sustainable. This is bad. Don't do this. And then next thing you know, 20 more books come out and say, just, you should. There's something else going on, isn't there? Okay, so can you all see that? I love this image because ah, it's, it kind of creeps up on you, doesn't it? And here, here's what's behind it. Here's what's behind it. This idea, genetics loads the gun, but what? Lifestyle pulls the trigger. trigger. This is the study of epigenetics, right? This is how your, what you eat and your environment will cause your genes to express themselves in certain ways, and usually in a way that brings about disease. Now, it was Frank Collins who led the, um, the Human Genome Project, which completely mapped out the human gen genome, and I think that completed in 2003. I think he's now director at the uh, Institute of Health um, in, uh, in Bethesda, right here in Maryland. Anyway, they mapped the human genome, and he coined that phrase that your genetics loads the gun, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. Does, any, does that make sense to everybody? In other words, I'll give you an example. There was a woman who was very concerned about uh, coming down with Alzheimer's disease because her mother came down with it. So she wanted to know, do I have the gene for Alzheimer's, right? So she went to her doctor and had herself, you know, evaluated, tested to see if she had genes that would predict that she would come down with Alzheimer's as well. Come to find out, she didn't have the gene. This is one example. There are lots of other types of examples. This is where they looked at twins and one would have something based on what they ate and the other one would not have it at all. But this woman, she did not have the genes to actually, or the gene to come down with Alzheimer's disease. However, they looked at her blood sugar, and she was pre-diabetic. She was almost, that's looking at the hemoglobin, the blood hemoglobin, A1C, right? Everyone gets that checked, and it looks at a three-month period, basically, of what's been happening with your blood glucose levels. And she was pre-diabetic, and she had all of the symptoms and the risk factors to actually come down with Alzheimer's, but it wasn't because she currently, at that point, had the gene. But the gene was going to become active. Why? Because her lifestyle was actually going to pull the trigger. So even if she had the gene, there was even a possibility where she didn't have to come down with Alzheimer's. Does that make sense to you? All right? So how you, again, food has messaging. Certainly, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, eat a lot of fat, and you cause insulin resistance, you are sending messaging to the pancreas and the cells, and you are clogging them up, and they will say, you know what? And as Dr. Wes Youngberg, who's a wonderful Adventist doctor, says, your cells end up being fat and happy and say, no thanks, right? And they resist the insulin unlocking that door. Now, the history of food as information. I'm going to go through this very quickly. You ready? History of food as information. Now, if you go through the scriptures from Adam and Eve, Eve especially, all the way down through the Bible, you'll find that food has been used as a trap. Even in Psalm 91, it says that he'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler. The snare. What's a snare? It's a trap, and that's a snare. What is it designed to catch? Catch what? Birds. Did somebody say a horse? No, no, not a horse. It's designed to catch birds. 
And it's really primitive when you look at it. It's just a box, a stick, and a string. But what is needed to make that thing effective? What? Faith. So that's why in Psalm 91, it tells you that I'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Guess who the, the fowl, I'm sorry, the, um, guess who, well, we know food is the bait. Who do you think is the prey? Who's the prey? As you go through, you're always the prey. And that's why you'll see in just a few moments as we look through the history of this thing, it's always been about people as prey and food as the bait. Right there from the very beginning, right? The very simple act of reaching out to a branch and pulling down something from the wrong tree sent the whole entire universe into chaos. And yet we diminish the messaging of food. When the very beginning of this whole controversy started with food. And then all you can go through and you can see that Enoch, I'm not Enoch, but um, you can go through and right there in the same book of Genesis, you'll find that there was an issue with Esau and Jacob. Esau and Jacob sold his whole birthright over some lentils. It was a lentil taco. <laughs> you, keep, you keep going through and you find that in Exodus, you had over a million people who were screaming and crying and weeping, according to Numbers chapter, chapter um, 11, who were crying in their tents because they wanted a certain type of food. And then, just going, well, you can, you can reject that all you want. I don't mind. I don't care. You know, you can say, ah, that's just a story. Whatever. The story tells us that those people who were weeping and crying over the thing that was not supposed to be their food, they did not make it into that new place they, they were traveling to. All of them didn't make it. And it was over again, food. But the messaging was clear. I want to take you on a journey. I want to love you. I want to wrap my arms around you. I want to be with you all the time. And you will be my people. That was the covenant promise. I want you with me. And they said, we'd rather have this. So the messaging was clear, even from the example of food, right? Daniel, you get to the book of Daniel. And again, I'm again, at my heart, I'm giving you the message that comes from the, the Bible. And the Bible says, I'm connecting you with the science and everything else, but the Bible tells us that in even the book of Daniel, he decided that he would not eat from the king's table. I think the Sabbath school lesson is dealing with that right now in terms of the life of Daniel, right? Anyway, who is information? Here's sort of the history of it. Not exhaustive in any way, but it's interesting. It's interesting to point out, I like to point it out, that it was at the end of the 1700s that our food dramatically shifted. It changed. There was a paradigm shift in our food at the end of the 1700s. That might resonate with some of you that at the end of the 1700s, there was something significant that took place in the world. And yet, right alongside that, our food changed at the exact same time. What happened? Napoleon, who was that general, the French general, he commissioned a man by the name of Nicolas Appert. He was challenged to create a way to preserve food for the troops as they were out in the fields, right? And he was known as the father of canning. He bottled, corked, and heated to kill bacteria. And it was in the late 1700s that the bottle was born. Then you find in 1810, Peter Duran, an Englishman, he used tin coated steel. That's a problem. This was all designed, how do we preserve food in such a way moving away from the agrarian kind of experience where you would plant it, grow it, eat it. Instead, how do you put it in a bag, put it in a can, put it in a box, and put it on a shelf for a long period of time? So processing, processed food is almost as bad as, say, some of the other things that might be a flesh food anyway. He used tin coated steel to protect bottles. The British started eating embalmed meat, and the can is born. That was 1810. Well, this is very quick. The 1821, William Underwood, who is um, the guy who established canning plant in Boston, canned vegetables, fruits, and cond condiments. This was the beginning of canning. Now, not in the bad, I mean, in a good way. Canning is good. You're going to take vegetables, put them in a mason jar, and you're going to 
you know, make sauce and things like that is great. But here was a different type. And the type it was was canning meat like deviled ham. Did you hear what I said? Deviled ham. Look, let me be clear. If ham is in a can, it's devilish. <laughs> All right? Continuing on. Then I started looking at it. I just, this launched me into a, just going through a historical perspective of all the things that began to come onto the market and it was messaging and it was causing us to be sicker and sicker and sicker. Look at this, 1886, Coca-Cola. Did you know Coca-Cola has been around that long? Coca-Cola, 1886, full of sugar. But I understand back then it was called Coca-Cola for a reason. Log cabin syrup, uh, 1888, that was an interesting year. Anyway, eight, 1888 log cabin, cabin syrup, it was syrup, which is already sweet, but they would put sugar in it, and it's, to this day, that's how they do it. And you have some mixture, some concoction that's not good. Anyway, I'm just kind of skipping through some of these, um, but I, I, I looked at this and I saw this, this blew my mind, right? Look at this thing. They've been tracking sugar consumption since the 1700s. Right? This whole food is information, and you understand in the context what I'm, that I'm sharing it, this is bad information. There's good information, there's bad information. This was bad information because we, we started to consume more sugar. And do you know how much sugar Americans consume today? It's everywhere. And as some say, it feathers the nest for most of our sicknesses and diseases. In fact, cancer loves sugar. And, you know, don't get me wrong, you understand. If you get a nice Fuji apple, a nice Bosque pear, or a nice orange, it's got sugar, but it's the right kind. When, when the one who loves makes it, he actually takes it and he adds with it vitamins and minerals and fiber, and it slows down the uptake of sugar into the tissue, and then you don't have the problem. But if you're just having free sugar, oh boy, look out, right? But we started consuming it like crazy. Look at the history of this thing. I love the way this thing, this graph charts it. You know, right after 1850, we went hog wild on it. These dips right here, what do you think those are? World War I and World War II. That's right. Go all the way down to the 2000s. But they've been tracking it ever since the 1700s because they could have the ship manifestos from the, from the um, little thing that was happening in the world called slavery. So they had sl uh, slave ship manifestos, and they could see, you know, because they were going down to the Caribbean, they were actually getting it to make rum, so sugar, 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 right? So that's how they have record of that. Look at this. 1891, 1893, 1897, more, more sugar in different ways. Processed cheese came along. More messaging. What message was that? Processed cheese, 1915. I, I thought it was interesting. 1912 is when the hamburger bun came which really sort of set the stage for fast food so you can get burgers quicker, faster, right? 1920, Wonder Bread and the mass production of refined flowers. 1920. And you know what they say, wonder why they call it bread, right? Okay, that one doesn't sit well with you. I'll give you another one. This one, you don't know this one, this will keep you healthy. You know this. The whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead. Avoid it at all costs because it just turns into sugar or glue in the colon. That's a whole nother story. 1929, Oscar Mayer Wiener, processed meats. And then finally we get to the Twinkie, 1930. 1930, did you all know that that's when the Twinkie came? 1930. What genius was thinking about how do we take a little cake and put some cream in it and that thing will sit on a shelf for a million years and people will love it. I'm not going to lie to you. When I did eat such things, I tell you, Twinkie was just something that was, it was amazing. The taste of it. It's addictive. Do you think that, I'm going to show you something in just a minute here that shows the addiction of food. 
And what fools are addictive. I've never seen that once. Somebody said, man, I'm just hooked on that broccoli, man. <laughs> Carrots got me, man. I just can't put them down. It just keeps calling me. and call You're right, you're right. You don't see that. But Twinkies, ah, how about fast food? This was information overload. Absolute information overload. Burger King, McDonald's. It was between 1940 and 1960. Just looking at the history, right? Guess what happened in that period? Cardiovascular disease increased by 37%. You fast food fans out here, you all looking at me real strange like, don't talk about my chicken. I should say at this point in time, I don't tell anyone what to eat. Anyone who knows my, my work and my lectures, I don't tell you what to eat. So if that's your thing, I'll joke about it and things like that. But you know what? It's up to you. It's really what you want to do. I give you the information, and then you do with it what you want, right? But it, at the heart and soul and the core of this, I want you to see something different. Every lecture I've given, it's been, how do we see a loving God in that? Do we see it in sickness? I don't think so. But when I share with you, the properties and the bioactives and the chemical type of responses between your genes and the food that was designed for the body, which you're going to see in just a moment, there's healing that comes. And when there's healing, that points to a God who heals. Is that right? That's what we want to see. So, okay, what's new is old. Now, this was an amazing study done by uh, Dr. Hannah... Um, Kaliova. <laughs> this was an amazing study. This was her study. She actually authored this, and it went, it went around the world. Yeah, yeah. And it looked at two meals a day effective to treat type 2 diabetes. Powerful study right here in your midst. No one in this church, not this church, CJ, should have type 2 diabetes. No one should. Because the research is there. And if you don't, and that was new to a lot of people because you know if you've ever gone to a fitness center and said, I want to work out and I want to talk to a nutritionist and that nutritionist would say, all right, here's the plan for your workout schedule and here's what you're going to do as you eat. You're going to have six small meals a day and you'll lose weight. Right? Anybody had that? But her study comes out and says, uh-uh-uh-uh, two meals are better. And this was new to a lot of people. But I asked the question. I said, whoa, wait a minute. Oh, that blocked my thing. I don't know what happened there. But it says two meals, two large meals. This was in Science Daily. It was just, just you know, everybody picked up the study. I thought it was, it was pretty powerful. Congratulations for something to go around the world like that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so what's new is, is, is really what's old. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. Because I looked at, I always go, this is how I think. I don't know about you, but how I think is, if the science now has caught up, I bet you God already said it. No offense, Hannah. But I always say, I bet you God already said it. I bet he already messaged this information. I'm sure he already told us. And in Exodus, it says, I have heard the complaints. This is when they were crying and whining because they wanted quail or fish, right? Because they were in Egypt. I've heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them saying, at twilight, you shall eat meat. And in the morning, you shall be filled with bread. You shall know that I am the Lord your God. That's what he said. How many meals did he give them? Now, please don't get caught on the fact that he says, I'm going to give you meat. Notice the context. He says, I'll give it to you. Why? They were complaining for it. Please, we want a chicken sandwich out here in the desert. Just a lousy chicken sandwich, please. Okay, a quail sandwich. And he gave it to them. Numbers chapter 11, you'll find it there and here. But he gave two meals a day. Here's the second place, Hannah. 
Second place in the Bible. It was in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 6 with Elijah. There was a huge, huge famine in the land. And God began to feed him by the ravens, miraculously. And how many meals did he give him? Two meals, one in the morning, one in the evening. So your study is on point along with God. You see that? Now, what's new as was old? Now, this is from Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 8. It said, feed me with food convenient for me. And I looked it up and it says, something prescribed, 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 prescribed. So God had prescribed food as information that would actually work with the chemical signals of the body to actually bring about health. Are you with me on that? I'm hitting it again and again and again because I really want you to know that the information that is being shared in your food is that God loves you. He loves you. He loves you and he wants you to be healthy. Now, are you all ready for this? You're not ready for this. Somebody next to you is, is, is kind of dozing off. Tell them, you, you wake up because you're, you're not ready for this. You can't sleep for this one. This is a video. I'm not even going to show you or let you hear the audio. But just a video. Now, you know, there's something right now called the coronavirus. We've got a lot of people who are panicked. Some saying that, you know, I think they just said from the World Health, the WHO, the World Health Organization has already said, this is very serious. It's increasing day by day. I know you've got your eyes on this probably. Um, the, the Lancet has come out with a study. I'm going to show you that in a second. But I want you to notice something again. I'm trying to show you what is the messaging from a loving God versus that which is something that we decide to do according to our, the dictates of our own heart. Is that, is that clear? Now, if you should happen to consume any of these things, no condemnation, no judgment. I'm just showing you what's going on, okay? Now, here's a marketplace in Wuhan, Wuhan, China, where it originated. I want you to notice a couple of things. You see that? Now, if you got a, if you got a weak stomach, don't look at any of this. What are those? Those are rats. Okay? They go through the market. I took out some of the things that are a little more objectionable. So I edited the video. What are those? Those are bats. Yep. Uh-huh. Those are bats. So they, they do have recipes for bat soup. Yeah. Yeah. So those are bats. Look at that. That's a big one right there. Yeah. What's that? That's a big old snake, isn't it? So the first, the first thing that came out, they said that they may, have been, they may have been eating snakes. And then I was talking to somebody, and they said, no, no, I think it was bats. I said, no, that's ridiculous. You heard the wrong information. And then I found this from a credible, credible source. In fact, the Lancet, which is reputable, they basically said that, yes, they looked and they examined the genes uh, of this virus, and they saw that it was actually found in humans. So therefore, according to them, they were eating the bats, and they, it's a normal thing over there, right? I don't wonder. Is that new? Like in the garden, when God says, you know what? All of these trees you can eat from. You can eat all this. Don't eat from that tree. Because I love you. And the messaging and the information that will come into your body will be one that will cause sickness and disease, not only for you, but for other people. You catch that? Later down the years, he says, okay, I'm giving you manna. It's from heaven. It's like coriander seed. It will be so good, you'll be like, what is that? In fact, that's what manna means. What is it? You won't need anything else. They said, we want something else. He says, but it's going to cause sickness and disease. We want it anyway. So it's the same thing. So I wonder, did he also put up some prohibition for eating bats? Yes, he did. And these, this is in Leviticus 
where he gives a whole chapter, Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. He basically tells you everything that you should eat. And God is merciful. You know, he's got a perfect will and he's got a per permissive will. He'll let you do something if that's what you want to do. But he will always say, this is what's best. I've placed before you today life and death. Choose life. Choose the things that will go in, harmonize with your DNA, bring about health and wellness, and you shall be healthy, happy, and inspirational. But if you eat that, you'll be sick, you'll be grumpy, you'll be bitter, and you'll be mean. And sick. So he gives a whole list. He says, and these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the what else? The buzzard, what else? The stork, the what else? The heron, after its kind. This is a cute little bird in Japan. But he said, don't eat it. And then what is the last thing? Don't eat bats. Oh, come on. They're so crunchy when you actually roast them with a little garlic and some. Come on, Lord, you're being restrictive. No, he's being loving. Because according to my understanding, the God who knows the end from the beginning, he already saw the coronavirus. He saw it. He says, don't do it. I can tell you right now, Israel, don't do it because I've already looked in 2019 and 2020 and people are going to be in a, a terrible situation and they'll be living the experience that was prophesied in Matthew 24 where there will be pestilence in the land. But I've told you in Psalm 91 that it shall not come nigh thy dwelling because you've made his truth your shield and your buckler. It will not come to you. Is that very clear? Let's keep going and begin to wrap this up. This is a principle. I always like to give a principle from the Bible that's a health principle, and it doesn't look like one. Have you ever seen this principle? It's a powerful principle. He was faithful in what is what? Is faithful also in what? And he who is unjust in what? Is least is unjust also in much. Now, how can that be a health principle? What is the least of the things in this world that you are responsible for? In other words, the smallest thing. Anybody? The what? You, 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 you have to be quiet. You've taken this. You've taken the course. Yes. What you eat? Yeah, 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 yeah. But but this, this is going to blow you away. I want you, I want you to really think with me here. What's the smallest thing? See, most of us don't think about this. But it's a powerful principle. There's a, something so small, but yet you're responsible for it. And when you're responsible for that little small thing, then you are accounted responsible for much bigger things. What you say? Yes, it's that. The cell. That's the smallest thing in the universe. Well, there's smaller things. But that's the smallest thing that you're responsible for because you can keep going down and down and down and down. There's smaller things, right? But the cell is the thing. Here's why you're responsible for it. Because it is that thing, right, that has as much activity going on as 3 o'clock traffic in New York City. And you've got trillions of them. And they're inside of you. And they're doing their perfect work. And if you could just peel back the curtains and magnify it, you would say, whoa, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'll praise him for it. Right? Everything you eat, you're not. Listen, listen to me very carefully. What you eat is not a matter of feeding your stomach. I always tell my son, son, slow down. You don't have to eat that fast. You don't have taste buds in your stomach. Taste the food, right? But you're not feeding your stomach. Eh, it feels good to get your tummy full. But what you're really feeding 
are your sins. At the most basic, fundamental level, what you eat is being broken down into nutrients and into chemicals that actually are distributed in a perfect manner by other chemical responses like magnesium, a mineral that actually directs traffic and you've got hormones and you've got enzymes and it's a beautiful, wonderful dance that's taking place and you don't even know that it's happening. All you know, the, the evidence that it took place, you know what the evidence is? Health. The moment you start to see sickness, you can know that you've not been faithful at the smallest thing. And if you can't be faithful with your cell, then you can't be faithful with your whole body organism. That's the principle. That's why the whole body will get sick if you're sick there. If you're sick on the smallest level, you'll be sick physically. Your bones, arthritis, pancreas, diabetes, your heart, disease, blood vessels, arteries, clogged up. See, God didn't make anything that's supposed to clog up your arteries. Love wouldn't do that. Love wouldn't do it. That's a different message. I'm talking about a message in the Bible. That's different information. So, there you see the double helix. There's DNA in food. There's DNA in your body. And they, as I mentioned already, they are in a wonderful relationship together. When we're eating right, it's a powerful relationship. All right. Okay, so what should our food be saying? It shouldn't be saying, I'll tell you what it shouldn't be saying. As I said earlier, it should not be saying, oh, I'm addicted to that. I need it. Oh, I get very, I get, okay, can I bear my soul in closing? Can I be vulnerable? You started it. She was very vulnerable there. I was so appreciative of, of sharing. That's the kind of sharing we need these days. Where people just say, you know what? What was the word you used? I'm wretched. What was it? No, it wasn't wretched. Rotten. That was me. I was like, so am I. Except for the grace of God. So, okay, I'm bearing my soul. I do have an addiction. There, I said it. I'm not proud of it. You want to know what it is? You look, so, you, look, you look a little too happy that I have an addiction. You're like, finally. <laughs> he's been up here just preaching at us, and now he's got a problem too. My addiction cookies. Anybody with me? You're with me? My sister, if I were right there, we would embrace right now in harmonious agreement. I, too, have never met a cookie that did not belong in my mouth. <laughs> never. <laughs> I don't care what kind. If it's just it's round, it's shaped, and it's flat like a little thing, it's a cookie, I'm going to eat it. Well, I should rephrase that. I would eat it. I used to eat it. Today, no cookies. Why? Because personally, I have evaluated what's the chemical response of all the sugar, all of the refined flour, all of the, what else is in there? If it's chocolate, the obroman, you know, it's got other things in it, you know. What's going to be the chemical response when I eat that? Now, I have learned, let's talk afterwards, trade notes. I have learned to make my own cookies. Aha. By the way, just so you know, if you're vegan and you're proud of that and you like dunking the Oreos because Oreos are vegan, but they're deadly in terms of all of the processed junk that's in them. But I digress. I have learned to make my own cookies. In fact, Neil Nedley has something they call depression cookies. They don't make you depressed. They make you happy. 
some of people call them happy cookies. And they've got, you know, flax in them, which has omega-3s. They make you feel good about yourself. Even those healthy ingredients, I've determined. Now, this is not for everybody. This is what I'm saying for me. Weekends only. Desserts are supposed to be something that you just do occasionally. Otherwise, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Right? And I want to keep being a wonderful example for God. Right? Yeah, amen. amen. So, so what should our food be saying? Should it be saying, I need more pizza? Let's begin to wrap this up. This is a little video for you with some audio. Marcus, take it away. How about that? You see how everything has messaging, has information, and it's directing you to do something or something to be done in your body? But you notice, what was at the bottom? Carrots and cucumbers. Eat a carrot, no guilt, no shame. No high. That's not true. She said no pleasure. That is not true. You know what, I, what I've started to do? I love carrots. Because see, Naturally, naturally, the, your mouth wants to crunch. It's just been replaced with cookies and chips as the primary crunch thing. But carrots and things like that, celery, I know I'm sounding really boring right now, but I'm telling you, in order for us to really have health, we got to get back to that which was old. And you know what I love now? I, I don't only buy the purple ones, but I prefer the purple ones. You too? The purple ones. They are really off the chart in terms of the antioxidant properties because the darker the better, right? Anyway. Now, when we got started um, several weeks back, we looked at these five areas. Angiogenesis, number two, regeneration, stem cells, um, immunity, microbiome, DNA protection. Those five things I gave you, I would take pictures of that. I would go study those. I would look at them. I would really look into starting a different process by which you eat, and that being a process where you start to look at what's that going to do. Again, I'm a little radical, and I have a lot of time out there in the country, so I've actually made a whole list of the foods that I eat, and I look at what they're doing. I really have. I say, okay, that's good for my bones. I'm going to have those celery, that celery. I'm going to have the vegetables that are high and have collagen and they have vitamin K and things like that, right? Calcium, high in calcium. I'm going to have those because I know that they're doing something for my bones. I take, you know, I have still steel cut oats every day. Every day I have steel cut oats um, at least five times a week, I should say. Sometimes on the weekend I switch it out. I have, I'm from the South, so I have a little bit of grits. Anybody know about grits? Come on, y'all. Talk to me. I'm sorry. That, was that? Grits, just do the study on polenta-style grits. I don't get the harmony grits, the white ones. I get the yellow ones. Yellow grits. Thank you very much. They are good. Also, help with the blood sugar. So, good regulator there, even though it's corn. Um, so, but I have that on the weekends. Like tomorrow. I'll have it tomorrow. Right? But I've looked at it. I'm just saying to you. I've looked at and I'm I'm imploring you to begin to be intelligent about the messaging in the body based on the food that God gave versus that which comes from other sources that may taste good, make you feel good, but have a negative effect long term. That's all I'm saying. And we find that the things that happen to be in the garden that are plant-based they stimulate those five things. Either it's stimulating angiogenesis, and I explained that I can't get into it right now, but you do your own study on it, angiogenesis, or they're regenerating stem cells. <clears throat> they're actually increasing your immune system, strengthening your immune system. They're actually helping your microbiome, and I'm going to close with that idea, the microbiome and fiber. This is something, I know this must fascinate you as a clinician, as a... Uh, scientists, how what goes on here affects what goes on here. Did you know that? This is called the second brain. Second brain, you know that. 
Why do they call this the second brain, your gut? Because it has the second largest cluster of neurons right here. And they're all connected by something called the vagus nerve. It goes from your gut all the way up to your brain. So there is cognition. There is cognitive action. That means that right here, there are, in the same way that your brain is sending chemical responses through all, you know, directing hormones and all your chemical responses, your gut is doing something very similar. And would you believe this? Guess what your gut loves more than anything else? Don't say ice cream. Don't say pizza. Say it again. Apples. What is it about the apple? It's the fiber. It's the fiber. Every Listen to me. Everything in the garden had fiber. So now, within the last 20, 30 years, we, we come into the microbiota and microbiome, and we study this thing and say, wow, you have more gut bacteria than you have cells in the body. And they love fiber. They love it. And do you know that when you actually feed your gut fiber, I'm talking about your big salad, I'm talking about having your nuts, I'm talking about having your legumes, having your fruit, the things that are right there in Genesis chapter 129 and Genesis 3.18, when you have those things, you are actually sending chemical responses or you're sending a chemical messaging to your microbiome which gobbles up the fiber and then it responds with this own chemical response. Did you know that? Here's what you need to know. There's something called butyrate. Butyrate is a chemical that actually comes from your gut bacteria, and it sends a signal, correct me if I'm wrong on this, to the cytokines. I don't mean to get all technical and sciencey, but let's just say your anti-inflammatory cells, or at least the immune part of your immune system that keeps the inflammation in check. Now, inflammation is good, isn't it? You got something that comes in, you wanted to heat that body up and heat up that area and start to kill it, right? The problem is we eat a lot of foods with no fiber, and then when it gets down here, our gut goes into a tailspin. It's like, whoa! It doesn't even register that the food that you're eating is not fibrous. It just says, We've got too much bad bacteria. We need inflammation to kick in. And most people walking around in a pro-inflammatory state and they don't even know it. So back when you go to the thing that was made out of love, it keeps all that stuff in check. It signals to the rest of the body, everything's all right down here. We're good. Just keep eating more of that. Does that make sense to you? Friends, I'm going to say to you what 3 John 2 says. Beloved, or as it says in the NIV, friend, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul is prospering. May God bless you. Thank you.